An episode of Mystery Diagnosis appears on the Discovery Health Channel one evening. On this episode, a young boy named Zachary Townsley and his worrying health condition are featured. The episode reports that on May 31, 2000, Zachary Townsley is born to Robert and Janine. He is a normal, healthy baby, and the couple excitedly takes Zachary home from the hospital. However, over the next several months, Zach seems to be developing slower than his brother Josh. He is always late at hitting developmental milestones, and his head is also noticeably large for his age. When Zachary begins walking at age two, his knees are bent, and he has a hard time balancing. Doctors tell the Townsleys to see an audiologist, a speech therapist, and a physical therapist to try to improve Zachary's development. The family sees the audiologist and is questioned if they believe Zach can hear or not. Of course, Mom and Dad both swear that Zach can hear. The tests reveal Zachary is only hearing at 20% of a normal hearing decibel. Tests also reveal that this is due to a fluid buildup in the ear and not neurological damage. Doctors then deduce that Zachary's poor balance and bent knees are due to the fluid in his ears, as this inhibits the body from being in equilibrium. Immediately, a surgery is performed to drain the fluid in his ears, and Zachary seems to improve afterwards. At three years old, Zachary's initial improvements have vanished. Doctors promise that Zachary would be caught up by three years, and he still isn't. At his three-year checkup, the family is told to see a genealogist. With disbelief, the Townsleys visit the genealogist and are immediately recognized as a severe case. Zach's facial features appear swollen. He walks with great difficulty, and his history of fluid buildup in his ears is suspicious. Also, Zach's great-grandmother had given birth to a son, Mark, who looked very similar to Zach due to swollen features. Mark died as a teenager. All of these clues led the genealogist to be fairly certain of Zach's condition. After several confirmation tests, Zachary Townsley is diagnosed with Hunter's syndrome, a serious genetic disorder that interferes with the body's ability to break down and recycle specific glycosaminoglycans, or GAG. GAG builds up in cells throughout the body due to a deficiency or absence of enzyme. This buildup interferes with the way certain cells and organs in the body function and leads to a number of serious symptoms, all of which Zachary was experiencing. Through taking each and every subtle symptom into consideration, Zachary Townsley was able to be diagnosed and begin an enzyme replacement therapy that is drastically improving his mobility. Even though none of Zach's symptoms appeared interrelated, the genealogist was able to connect all of Zach's symptoms and explain them with one universal understanding, a disease called Hunter's Syndrome. This piecing together of different phenomena in order to diagnose an illness parallels how the two practices of science and Buddhism can be combined, ultimately describing a better understanding of our world. Through extensive research and thorough understanding of both science and Buddhism, the two become indistinguishably interconnected. Both science and Buddhism, like Zachary's symptoms, simply are different pieces of the overall larger puzzle of the universe and world in which we inhabit. Although doctors were able to treat Zach's fluid-filled ears when his hearing deficiency was discovered, they were totally unable to treat Zach's illness until all of his problems could be explained. Science and Buddhism are able to sufficiently explain events differently when one or the other is explored, but the combination of both may provide us with an even deeper more fundamental understanding of our reality and existence altogether. Meditation, quantum physics, and metaphysical theories such as muriological nihilism are some such subjects that can be described by both science and Buddhism, and it is through exploring these subjects that a connection between the two will arise. Meditation, although unknown in origin, is an ancient practice that has been utilized for hundreds, even thousands of years. One might participate in meditation for a variety of reasons, including mental clarity, stress relief, and self-awareness. From an observed standpoint, there are two major ways in which one participates in meditation. Analytical meditation and stabilizing meditation. Either way, the goal of meditation is to clear the mind of all external thought by focusing on breathing or on the body. This clearing of the mind allows the individual to become self-aware, and the person enters a higher state of consciousness. In this state, a person's mind is essentially empty, absorbed in the nothingness of repetitive breathing or other sensations. This ultimate state of meditation reflects Buddhism's ultimate goal. 
renouncing all possessions and desires, having nothing, wanting nothing. Through meditation, a Buddhist is able to train his mind to become empty, allowing himself to see past the illusory misperceptions that cloud reality. From a scientific standpoint, Meditation has been recognized as an excellent way to reduce stress and relieve anger issues. Many licensed doctors recommend that patients participate in mentally soothing activities such as meditation on a regular basis to ensure mental well-being. Neurological tests performed on a few participants while meditating indicate that these participants produce many anomalous brain functions. Such tests suggest that habitual meditation actually changes the way the brain is wired and that these alterations could be at the heart of claims that meditation can improve health and well-being. To further test this notion, Richard Davidson, a neuroscientist at UW-Madison's W.M. Keck Laboratory for Functional Brain Imaging and Behavior, devised an experiment in which 250 monks and students were fitted with a total of 256 electrical sensors and asked to meditate for short periods. After this experiment, Davidson discovered that the results undeniably showed that meditation activated the trained minds of the monks in significantly different ways from that of the students. More importantly, the sensors picked up a much greater activation of fast-moving and unusually powerful gamma waves in the monks, and they found that the movement of the waves through the brain was extremely better organized and coordinated than in the students. The meditation novices showed nearly a slight increase in gamma wave activity while meditating, but a few monks produced gamma wave activity more powerful than any previously reported in a healthy person, Davidson said. Davidson's work on the scientific effects of meditation on the brain solidifies a connection between science and Buddhism. Because meditation has such profound effects on the brain, scientists must conclude that practicing meditation actually changes the way the brain functions. If meditation alters the brain, which is the instrument of consciousness and subconscious thought impulses, and the mind is the end product of the brain, then what is doing the changing of the brain and the mind? Realizing that the mind and the brain are dependent on each other, the mind is unable to affect the brain, and the brain unable to change the mind. The mind cannot change itself, since it is merely a result of the brain, and it cannot change the brain because it is a product of the brain. The brain cannot change the mind as it is simply the hardware through which the mind operates. Lastly, the brain can't change itself because without some force influencing the mind, it is lifeless. The only explanation scientists can give is what Buddhists have known for hundreds of years. Consciousness is what changed the brain and the mind. This consciousness is a difficult concept to grasp and even more challenging to describe scientifically, but it is basically the invisible life essence that animates the brain. Admittedly, consciousness isn't the easiest idea to experiment on, yet Davidson has essentially proven its existence through his neurological studies of those practicing meditation. Since consciousness scientifically exists, and Buddhists have been aware of consciousness for hundreds of years, then science and Buddhism must be fundamentally interconnected. Not only are science and Buddhism connected through meditation, the two are also connected through quantum theory. Quantum theory was developed by a number of physicists as an effort to explain phenomena, especially phenomena occurring on atomic and molecular levels, at which classical physics failed. Although quantum theory is a vast subject, a few of its salient features include wave-particle duality, complementarity, and uncertainty. In quantum theory, atomic components such as electrons behave as waves under some circumstances and manifest properties of particles under others. Because of this property, electrons themselves cannot be defined as either waves or particles. They can only be said to have a wave-like nature or particle-like nature in relation to a given experiment. Consequently, these electrons cannot be viewed as part of an external world which exists apart from the observer, since the observer determines what properties electrons exhibit. This wave-particle duality of electrons inspired French physicist Louis de Broglie to suggest that this property applied not only to electrons and light, but to matter as well. Therefore, not only does all matter have particle-like quantities, but it also exhibits wave-like quantities as well. Although electrons and all matter exhibit both wave and particle properties, one can never see something behave both as a wave and a particle simultaneously. This fact is known as complementarity. One can choose to do experiments that elicit 
either wave nature or particle nature, but one can never observe both properties in a single measurement. Since the observer essentially chooses which response, wave-like or particle-like, this wave-particle duality really only exists because of the third-party observation. The observed phenomenon and the observer together constitute the complete system.